Hey everybody, welcome to Redeemer and this Wednesday Reflection uh, for September 21st, 2022. Um, I'm going to talk to you today just a teeny bit about the monarchy in England and how next Wednesday, not today, but next Wednesday, we're going to be doing a, a commemoration for the late Queen Elizabeth II. Um, a, a quick note on that. Um, Unfortunately, I was out of town all last week, and so um, while the world was preparing for the Queen's funeral and, and the kind of the, the visitations that were done across England and Scotland, um, uh, we uh, I wasn't able to really get anything done as far as our intended service. So um, even though the, the Queen's funeral was on Monday, uh, we're a little late to the game than I would have wanted to be. However, being out of town um, kind of just pushed those things back. Regardless, next Wednesday um, on uh, September twenty uh, September twenty eighth, um, we are going to uh, have a, a, a commemorative um, service in honor of the late Queen Elizabeth II um, at five thirty here at the church. Now, why are we doing this? This is the point of today's meditation. Um, I I wanted to explain a little bit about why the death of the British monarch is a big deal for us and why I posted a whole bunch of stuff on on social media about it. Um, It's because that, uh, obviously, this is the Episcopal Church, which is a member of the Anglican Communion, the global uh, group of uh, the Church of England and its descendant colony, churches and commonwealth churches. Um, So we have a shared general theology and history, even though, of course, as we know, that history is uh, fraught with uh, turmoil around colonialism and and such as that. But we share a common history. And even though today we don't always agree on everything, for example, um, you know, what is considered uh, Episcopal or Anglican or English in America um, might different from how that faith is expressed with Anglican churches, say in Africa or other parts of the world. Uh, we still are part of the Anglican Communion, and much like the British Parliament itself, um, we are free to grumble and and wag our fingers or, or shake our fists at um, at each other um, and harumph. But we um, we're all still working through it together. Um, I I love that we're not of a common voice all the time. We acknowledge that we uh, can sit in partnership uh, with these notions and ideas and, and theological issues and, and, and beliefs and still you know, be brothers and sisters in Christ and in the Anglican Communion. All right, so the monarch of England, whether it's Elizabeth II, uh, Charles III, Henry VIII um, is the supreme governor of the Church of England. It's a, a, a sort of the, the titular head of, of the Church of England of, from whom we descend. Um, and it's a mostly ceremonial role. Obviously, the Archbishop of Canterbury is seen as the, um, the head cleric of the church and for all intents and purposes is the, the leader of the Anglican Communion and, and the Church of England. Um, but even the archbishop reports to the monarch. Um, and, and, and the, much like a lot of the ceremony, a lot of the monarch's duties are, uh, nowadays mostly ceremonial, uh, they do appoint high ranking members of, uh, the church as well as, you know, the prime minister of the UK technically, um, and, uh, and the, the Lord's spiritual of the church, that would be the, the bishops, the House of Lords, things like that. Um, anyway, here's some history. So Henry VIII of England uh, broke away from the Roman church in uh, 1536, um, seizing the assets of the Catholic church in England and Wales and declaring it the Church of England. So we're, you know, we, are, we are seceding and we are becoming independent, essentially. Um, and he... Uh, appointed himself as supreme head of the newly formed Church of England. Uh, so the Act of Supremacy in 1534 uh, confirmed the king's status having supremacy over the church 
and requiring the peers to swear uh, an oath of allegiance recognizing Henry's supremacy. Um, now, Henry's daughter, Mary I, was Catholic and took the throne um, after some time and tried to, oh, it did get rid of it because she was Catholic and wanted to try to move uh, England's churches back to Rome. Um, but then when Elizabeth I ascended to the throne in 1558, uh, Parliament then passed the Act of Supremacy 1558, which sort of uh, renewed the 1536 uh, Act of Supremacy. Um, but it is, but again, even that act was was still full of criticism because there were still plenty of Catholics in England and Protestants in England, um, and so when they did that, it was still uh, fraught with with uh, conversation and grumbling and whatnot. And so they were very careful when they recrafted the Act of Supremacy. Um, it gave the monarch's title as supreme governor of the church, not supreme head of the church, because that avoided uh, any kind of claim to divinity uh, or usurping Christ, who the Bible identifies as the head of the church. And the, the you know, across centuries, you know, kings and queens and their right to rule and their coronations and their power have often been described in terms of by divine right, um, I am monarch because it's willed by, it's the will of God, and so I, I, I rule through the will of God to rule my kingdom, my fiefdom, my, my realm. Um, and so... Uh, and even you know, if you ever watched The Crown on Netflix or or watched you know historical footage of of coronations, um, you know you have that screen that comes over uh, the monarch when they're being uh, crowned, and there's a blessing, and it's supposed to kind of hide this very holy moment from just common view, uh, keeping it kind of uh, uh, quiet and somber and solemn, and not just a spectacle pageant thing for all the world to see. Although, let's face it, coronations are pretty full of pageantry. Um, and so there is a divine element in the coronation of a monarch. Um, and it still has a lot of that gravitas behind it. I'll be interesting to see how they handle uh, Charles's coronation coming up. Um, but anyway, I'm, 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 getting, I'm getting sidetracked. Um, The monarch is seen as defender of the faith. It's part of their title. Um, and uh, and this was actually a title that was given to Henry VIII back in 1521 uh, um, by Pope Leo X. And so Henry was the defender of the faith in England prior to uh, his seceding from the Roman Church. And he was given that title, defender of the faith, because of his opposition to the Protestant Reformation, so the Pope awarded him this title. The Pope then withdrew that title after the split, um, but then Parliament came back later um, during the reign of uh, Edward VI, uh, his son, and um, reconfirmed that title as Defender of the Faith. And it's been, it has carried down from monarchs ever since. Um, in fact, the, the 39 Articles, uh, which is in the back of our Book of Common Prayer, um, says, uh, being by God's ordinance, according to our just title, defender of the faith and supreme governor of the church, within these our dominions, we hold it most agreeable that this our kingly office and our own religious zeal to conserve and maintain the church committed to our charge in unity of true religion and in the bond of peace, so on and so forth. Um, so in a way, the monarch is the leader of the church, but leaves the um, pastoral and, and, and clerical clergy responsibilities to the Archbishop of Canterbury. Um, and so, yeah, um, that is essentially the, the, the why we still hold the English monarch in such high esteem here in the Episcopal Church and in Anglican churches all around the world. Um, and um, anyway, that's why we do it, and that's why we, 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 we 
have more allegiance to, say, the monarch of England than, say, the monarch of Sweden, for example. Um, but anyway, that's why we bother to make a big deal of it. And, you know, as, as if you're an Episcopalian and kind of an Anglophile like me, um, this is all great history. This is all stuff that dates back to the founding of the Church of England and what makes our flavor of Christianity uh, so unique and special from, say, the Roman Church, the Orthodox Church, other Protestant churches like, you know, Methodism or uh, Lutheranism or Calvinism um, or Zwinglianism. Um, and actually, yeah, I said Methodism. Uh, John and Charles Wesley, the founders of the Methodist Church, were Anglican priests and, and died Anglicans, uh, never intending for the Methodist Church to actually be its own separate thing. They just wanted a new... Uh, a new uh, theme, a new way of doing things within the Church of England, uh, within Anglicanism. Anyway, that's, that has nothing to do with this, but I, I mentioned it, so I started talking about it. All right, that's my, uh, my brief little history nugget for today. That's our Wednesday reflection. Please come and join us next uh, Wednesday at 5.30 p.m. here in the church, and we will do a commemorative uh, service uh, for the late Queen Elizabeth II. Uh, thank you, and as always, dear ones, God bless.